and I'll go ahead. Um, I have a few remarks that I'd like to make before getting into our agenda, but I will go ahead and call our meeting to order. Great to see everybody. Um, we, I missed you all, some of you all last month, and I am glad um, that we are back in action in April. And I also want to thank uh, our guests for joining us tonight as well. Before we get to our first item, I do want to recognize the what I think was a collective sense of relief that so many of us are feeling after the Derek Chauvin um, verdict yesterday and that he was found guilty on all charges. And while this represents an act of accountability for the heinous crime that was committed, the verdict in and of itself does not mean justice has been done. And indeed, as Mayor Gloria said yesterday, quote, it is my hope we will take up the important work that remains to address the systemic wrongs against Black people in this country and come together to heal. And I think that you know, that work is such an important part of what we as a commission aim to do um, and something that I hope we will be able to do in partnership with the new Office of Race and Equity. And I also wanted to mention that while we missed our March commission meeting, uh, March was Women's History Month, an important opportunity for our city to shine a light on the extraordinary legacy of trailblazing women and girls who built, shaped, and improved San Diego, often in the face of discrimination and undue hardship. And as we celebrated the contributions of women and girls, it's also important to reflect on the unequal burdens that women, and particularly women of color, bear today. As the city prepares to launch its Office of Race and Equity, I hope that in addition to its focus on racial equity, it will also work to address sexism, the gender wage gap, and under other gender-based discrimination moving forward. And with those words, I'd now like to move into our formal agenda and ask all of my colleagues on the commission to please keep your video on throughout the meeting uh, to remain as accessible as possible to our audience. And I ask the same of our presenting, uh, of our presenters. And I know uh, Commissioner Rossi told me he can't have his video on, but everybody that can, please, please do. I'm now gonna go ahead and call the roll. Commissioner Beltran. Okay. Commissioner Canizales. Here. Commissioner Detsky weil Here. Commissioner Gillies? Here. Commissioner Higa? Here. Uh, and Commissioner Mode uh, as an excused absence. Commissioner Molig? Here. Commissioner Purcell? Oh, I see you. Getting bad here. <laughs> Commissioner Murray Ramirez? Commissioner Razi Jafari. Present. Commissioner Rizzo. Here. Commissioner Thomas. Here. Commissioner Zaragoza. And I believe I now officially have the honor of welcoming our newest commissioner, Commissioner Ricky Brown tonight. Are you present? Hi, Ricky. Hi, everyone. Hello, welcome. And I don't want to catch you off guard, but if there's anything you'd like to say, since it is your first meeting, please feel free to share a few words if you'd like. Just uh, thank you guys for having me. Looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I do see a phone number. Is that you, Commissioner Murray Ramirez? Uh, yes. Wonderful. We were just wrapping up roll call and are glad that you are here. And uh, I did want to make a note uh, that we are looking for a commissioner to serve as secretary to take notes during tonight's meeting. Given our very limited staffing, this would be greatly appreciated. I know we've asked this, uh, I think, at a previous meeting, and I'm wondering if there's anyone willing to do this tonight. Oh, is that a hand up, Commissioner Purcell? 
Thank you so, so much. All right, and before we move on with our meeting, I'd like to recognize staff and guests present. Joining us today are Sam Choi and Kim. Because we were sued by Nancy Pelosi in Congress Yikes. not to build Sorry, the wall. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, just a reminder to please uh, mute, uh, as, uh, as well as Tommy Howe. And we are also joined uh, from representatives from the mayor's office. Um, and of course, the city's immigrant affairs manager and our HRC staff liaison. Now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Farhat to run down some guidelines for tonight's meeting. Good evening. Um, as you've all noticed, uh, we are conducting this meeting as a Zoom webinar. Um, in an effort to provide greater accessibility, members of the public may join the meeting as webinar attendees in order to provide virtual, non-agenda, and agenda comment in real time. Commissioners, city staff, and authorized presenters are attending the meeting as panelists, and the meeting will function for them identically as a typical Zoom meeting. Uh, please note the buttons on the control bar at the bottom of the Zoom window. The camera icon is to activate your video. The microphone is to mute and unmute. Please remember to stay muted when you're not talking and to unmute yourself when you speak. Um, you will also see the chat win window button. Please keep your chat window open at all times as you will be using that uh, to signal when you'd like to speak. We do recognize that there's a hand raising function, but we request that you type speak in the chat window for the record and the chair will acknowledge requests in order. Um, when wanting to make a motion, second a motion or participate in a discussion, please type speak in the chat box and Chair Hazen will call on you in the order entered. Please refrain from using the meeting chat for anything other than signaling that you'd like to speak in order to comply with the Brown Act. I will also just mention that for uh, Nicole and, and others on the phone, um, if you are joining the phone, please press star nine to raise your hand and that will signal to myself um, and others that, that you would like to speak. I will then call on you by the last four digits on, uh, of, of your phone number. And when I do call on you, you can press star six to unmute yourself. Um, please raise your hand when, whenever you would like to speak and we can go through that process if you are on the phone. And with uh, that, uh, what, this is Nicole, what number did you say? Sure, so you What press, number did you say if we wanna speak? Sure, you press star nine to raise your hand. Oh, all mm -hmm. right, thank you. Yes, of course, thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you, Farhat. Uh, and now we are going to move into non-agenda public comment. The public was invited to submit public comment on agenda and non-agenda items via a web form accessible through the agenda and the commission's website. Members of the public may also join this meeting as webinar attendees and if members of the public have submitted comments in writing via the web form, staff will read aloud public comment submitted per city public comment protocol. And I will call on Farhat. I know you mentioned you hadn't received any, just want to confirm no public comments before the meeting. Correct. No non-agenda public comment was submitted in advance. Okay. Thank you. And now moving on to our next item, approval of minutes from February. Is there any public comment for this agenda item? Hearing none. Okay. May I please get a motion to approve our minutes? And again, those are included in your meeting packet with links to recordings. I'll move to approve the minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? Commissioner Higa seconds. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. I also uh, wanted to let you know that I reviewed the action items identified at our last meeting, many of which will be addressed later on uh, tonight in tonight's agenda. Of the action items that we will not receive reports on, uh, I would like to share um, that our template statement on extremism 
uh, which you saw was updated per Commissioner Rizzo's request. Um, and it was used um, in a letter condemning the killing of API community members in Atlanta last month um, and showing our strong solidarity and support for the AAPI community. Um, unfortunately, um, we have been informed by the city attorney's office that even though the commission voted to approve that template letter so that we could quickly respond uh, to acts of extremism and hate by putting out statements, um, we've been told that we cannot do that because each unique statement needs to be publicly noticed and voted on by the commission. And so um, I am trying to come up with, you know, to see if there is another way. I've asked uh, the city attorney's office if I may um, submit or share statements um, as the chair, but not on behalf of the commission. So we'll see if we can do that, uh, but did want to update everyone about that. And I am, oh, I also wanted to add though, um, before we were aware of that, the statement was released and I was interviewed on NBC7 um, as a result um, and did have an opportunity uh, to talk about the impact um, that inflammatory, hateful language um, has uh, and how our words matter and make a difference um, in creating a climate of hate and hopefully um, working to cultivate a climate of peace. So that happened um, and we will work on another way to get statements out moving forward. Uh, and with that, I'd like to move into our item uh, on anti-API extremism. Um, again, we are joined by Sam Choi and Kent Lee and also by Tommy Howe. Is there any public comment for this agenda item? No public comment was submitted in advance. Um, to those members of the public in attendance, please click the button to raise your hand to indicate if you would like to comment. Seeing none, I think we're good to move forward. Great. Uh, uh, this is uh, Nicole Marie Ramirez. I pressed star nine twice. Uh, so I don't know if that's working or not. I, I see your hand raised, uh, Nicole, but it, it's been raised since we had that conversation. So I wasn't sure if, if it was perpetually raised or if you would like to speak. So uh, please, please feel free. Thank you. Um, I'm very concerned. I, I'm really happy to hear that the chair was able, uh, did put out a, uh, a statement and and definitely was interviewed. I think it's very important that, and I know in the past, the chair has had that authority and that right. Uh, usually the chair has run it by a couple of people, but has made statements. We cannot wait for a week or a month till another meeting when things are moving very fluidly in so many areas, when it comes to hate crimes, when it comes to issues of importance, uh, and San Diego. So I do hope uh, that you will look into this and get a quick response uh, that enables you to make a statement. Because many times, as you all know, they've asked, oh, well, what does the HRC do? And, and what is their stance and so forth? And some of these issues are very easy. But what I have found in the past is the media will look at all the people that do make statements. And a lot of times, pick out the Human Relations Commission chair because they feel that that is a commission that involves the, definitely the diversity of our city. So I'm glad to see that you're looking into this and I think it has to be a top priority, especially during these um, difficult times. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think you know, Farhat will note I have been pushing and trying and trying to you know, figure out a way because I think it's as frustrating for me uh, as it sounds like it is for you. Um, but of course, we have to comply with the Brown Act. Um, and because of that, you know, we can't issue statements on behalf of the commission. But I'm hopeful that I can issue statements as the chair um, and that each of us as individual commissioners can issue statements um, so that we can get the word out there um, as a commissioner, but not on behalf of the commission. So I agree and I'm continuing to work on that. 
Well, uh, actually, what, when your discussions with the city attorney, you can remind her that that has been going on for years, that the chair has had that now. There is a stickler, I believe, that commissioners cannot, that the only one that has, as a spokesperson has to be the chairperson, only one person. Uh, obviously, we can do, do it as individually, but not with our, with our uh, titles. You, though, uh, can because every chair is. So I will be very interested to see the response of the city attorney. Yes, I agree. And I think I may uh, invite someone from the city attorney's office to join us at the next meeting, just so we can talk through this and make sure we're all on the same page about what we can and can't. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. And I'm wondering, Farha, could Thank you, you note that so that we can invite, invite them? Thank you. Okay. And now continuing on uh, with item four, anti- um, Stina, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, we do have some uh, commissioners who would like to speak who know in the chat box. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm sorry, I have multiple screens open. Uh, Commissioner Higa, would you like to share uh, what you mentioned in the chat? Yeah. <clears throat> in previous meetings years ago, there were some issues about how we get information to the public sooner or um, I know there was some hate crimes with um, the gay community in Hillcrest where there beating beatings going on and there was a concern I know Nicole and a bunch of us were trying to figure out a way that we address this sooner than waiting for the next meeting like he mentioned or uh, what is the protocol like what you did on the news I saw that that was perfect like what we should be doing to get the public aware quick as possible what the HRC is um, concerned about. And I think uh, we lack that. We've been lacking that for many years until this year when you took office here. But I think um, the sad part about this is we're not taking action as quickly as um, we should be, in my opinion, especially yeah. in, because of our committee. I, I, I agree. And so I think we are all on the same page. You know, the sentiments I'm hearing from you and Commissioner Murray Ramirez, and of course, how I feel is that we do need to be out there. We do need to be making statements um, that is central to our work. So we will, we will find a way to do that. I'm looking uh, in the chat, uh, Commissioner detsky Weil, did you want to share something? Yeah, I just wanted to say it is in the bylaws that the chair can speak on behalf of the commission. So um, you're doing the right things. It's okay. great to see you on the news. Thanks. All right. Well, good. Thank you for the vote of confidence. I appreciate it. All right. Now, uh, anything else on uh, the last item before we move on to item four? Uh, yes, this is uh, Nicole Murray Ramirez again. Um, also, uh, recently, uh, our new uh, commissioner, uh, uh, Commissioner Brown, and I went to two uh, demonstrations rallies uh, in support of anti-Asian Pacific Islander crime. That being said, there's a lot going on, and uh, some of us could attend. I, I barely had found out about uh, there was going to be a proclamation uh, by Councilwoman Montgomery on uh, uh, for uh, Palestine Day in the city of San Diego, a very uh, historic document, uh, proclamation. And uh, I could have been there if I knew about it. And I think many of the commissioners could attend um, some of these events if they were knowledgeable. How do we get this type of information, of forms, of because uh, there's so many issues that are going on uh, which pertain to the Human Relations Commission and, and, and our goals and our, our thoughts and our activism uh, to be able to know about them beforehand and, and, and go to them. And also have cards been printed up for each of the commissioners because we when when a, a commissioner does attend these events, they can drop their card off so the organizers will know that, that we have representation there. Yes, so we will we'll get to that. So they have not been, we have been asking, um, and uh, I believe uh, Commissioner Khan is also, and we're talking about external relations, we'll talk about that. And I do wanna just remind everybody that 
as you hear about whether it's rallies or proclamations or any community event relevant to the Human Relations Commission, if you just forward that to Farhat, um, she can send it on to all of us. So even if you're not sure, or I don't know if people want to come, please send it. Um, the more, the better. And I would ask um, city staff as well, if there's anything relevant to our work and our mission that you please invite us and share information, because that is really uh, is, it, is it Nicole, could you, uh, could, who, who should I send this to? To Farhat. You said, could, could uh, they uh, send me their email or how I contact them? Yeah, so far, absolutely. And yeah. I know Farhat sends you the agenda, so it's just, you could reply to the last uh, email that she sent. I think there was one as recently as yesterday. And oh, okay. so she's the main communication person. Correct, correct. All right, thank and you. And is the uh, immigrant affairs manager for the city as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and move us on to uh, item four. Uh, and this is an issue we had hoped to talk about last month. I am glad that our guests are back with us again tonight. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, acts of violence against Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities have been on the rise both locally and nationally. And I am pleased to have Sam Choi Kent Lee and Tommy Howe with us tonight to present on this issue. Uh, I shared already that we did issue a statement last month, which I spoke about. Um, and I also wanna let everyone know, especially for some of our newer commissioners that we have on our HRC web page, website, a Stop AAPI Hate page with a link to report incidents of AAPI hate on our website. Um, and I can actually link that in the chat for everyone. Uh, it also includes the language from the June resolution the city council adopted denouncing xenophobia and anti-Asian racism. I'd now like to introduce Sam Choi. He is the assistant director for the 21st Century China Center at UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy. Samuel also serves on the San Diego County Human Relations Commission, on the core team of the San Diego API Coalition, and on the board of Alliance San Diego. He co-founded Welcoming San Diego, a cross-sector initiative to advance immigrant integration, uh, which the HRC um, is also very involved in. Kent Lee is the executive director of Pacific Arts Movement, a media arts nonprofit best known for presenting the San Diego Asian Film Festival. Kent serves as the co-chair of the San Diego Asian Pacific Islander Coalition, as well as on the boards of the Mira Mesa Community Planning Group, the Asian Business Association of San Diego and UC San Diego's Chancellor's Community Advisory Board. And our presentation this evening uh, for it, we will begin with Sam and Kent. Um, they'll speak for about 10 minutes then I will introduce Tommy Howe, will speak, who will speak and present as well. And then we'll open it up uh, to Q&A with commissioners. So Sam and Kent, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to get us started. I'm going to pull up some slides um, just because we have some information um, that we'll share. And some of you who have been at the County Human Relations Commission have um, seen a version of this already. So. Um, but as we've learned in, across many meetings, there's often op an opportunity to really share new information, um, even with those who might have some sense of history. Um, and so Sam and I are here tonight um, on behalf of the San Diego Asian Pacific Islander Coalition. Um, we are an, a group that formed last year in response to um, hate during the pandemic. Um, as was mentioned, we helped with a resolution at the city council level, and it's hard to believe that it's been almost a year since that um, first took place. And so we are very much looking forward to engaging um, this commission on what steps might um, help be helpful to move forward. Um, and, and I think as we're looking at what's taking place today, it, it's often upon us to think about what history has um, sort of taught us. And that's just briefly what I wanna be able to share a little bit about. Um, when we talk about anti-Asian hate, it's not just about what we're seeing in the present day. A lot of this reflects what we have seen over the course of American history. And maybe even just to start back in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, which was perhaps the first exclusionary immigration act that the United States put into place, um, specifically um, restricting immigration from Chinese immigrants um, for about 10 years um, at that time. 
And, you know, over the course of that early history, I think we saw a lot of anti-Chinese American rhetoric that maybe is not that unfamiliar compared to what we've seen now. Um, Asian Americans, especially over time, have been referred to as a bit of a yellow peril um, and are often thought of as unclean or unfit um, in this particular case for immigration or citizenship. Um, and even when you look at the late 1800s and early 1900s, we saw many cases where Chinese Americans often were scapegoated for any kind of diseases that were brought in the United States. An example would be a bubonic out, um, plague outbreak in the uh, 1900s in San Francisco, where they actually quarantined the entirety of Chinatown as a result. Um, if we fast forward to World War II, um, I think many have learned over history, um, Executive Order 9066, um, which caused the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans, many of them who were actually US citizens, um, second, third generation families who had been here, um, but because of the war were um, you know, rounded up and sent away, lost their homes, their businesses. Um, and this was something that certainly has impacted us here even in San Diego. Um, we've actually had a couple documentaries from local filmmakers, we'd be happy to share those if anyone's interested, that cover even the many families who have impacted, been impacted here. And as a part of that history, um, sort of on the flip side, we had members uh, of the Japanese American community serving in the United States Armed Forces um, in the 442nd and 100th um, regiments during World War II on the European front. And these were, you know, combat units that actually saw the largest losses of life um, uh, and some of the most decorated sort of armed uh, force members that served on our behalf of our country in the hopes that they could prove their loyalty um, to our country. And then we look at, you know, history is not always just about what has explicitly taken place against the community. It's also sometimes how history is told. Um, over the course of the mid 1900s, um, there was a lot of exploitation, particularly of Filipino um, farm laborers. And um, this really culminated in a big strike in the 1960s um, by Delano grape strikers. And um, the gentleman on the left here, Larry Itliong, is one that is often forgotten when it comes to history and what is actually told. And most of the, the time when people think back to that labor movement and the start of the United Farm Workers, they think of Cesar Chavez. And um, it's important to just point out that Larry was very much um, a key part of that movement, if not really the one that started it considering Filipino workers um, went on strike weeks before Mexican American laborers joined them. And that's a critical part of history that we often um, leave behind. And then when we look at 1982, we have the murder of Vincent Chin uh, in Detroit. Um, he was murdered by two white men who ultimately um, were let go on probation with only a $3,000 fine. And it was sort of a landmark moment that started a significant conversation around what, what actually defines hate crimes uh, here in the United States. And when we fast forward to today, I think some of this rhetoric has continued um, as we look at how the United States has sort of treated uh, people who might be considered others. And this just as a local example is a flyer that was posted, um, whether for, um, you know, to, to in, inflict shock or to really um, hurt people was actually posted at UC San Diego in 2017, um, just as a, an example of something that resembles very much the um, 9066 order that was um, put in place in the 1940s. And that brings us to today with the arrival of COVID-19. As you've all known, um, the pandemic has now been here for just over a year. And what we look back at sometimes is, you know, when we think of February, for example, last year, this is pre-masks, pre-stay-at-home orders. And already at that time, we were seeing concerns, for example, here in Chinatown, San Francisco, of impacts of hate, um, you know, uh, affecting businesses and local individuals. We had um, Supervisor Fletcher and Councilmember Kate organized um, a discussion here again before everything shut down. And a lot of it ties back to rhetoric and the language that we choose to use to define the virus. Um, it's something that we know has had a significant impact. It was part of the original statement that the coalition put out last year. And I think it's something that also was addressed in the city's resolution. I'm gonna pass it to Sam, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the data and what we're seeing today. Thanks, Kent. So um, as Kent has um, really uh, aptly walked us through the history, here we are at this moment where the community, both locally and across the country, have really galvanized uh, together and not just building power within the AAPI community, but across 
uh, different ethnic and racial and religious groups. So um, as a response, um, a group of advocacy organizations and um, researchers uh, came together at the very beginning uh, just to try to document and really bring some uh, evidence to bear about the uh, rise. Um, so in addition to the, you know, the media reports and the very little um, reporting that's directed to law enforcement, we know we're just scratching the surface when it comes to understanding the problem. And so this site, Sub API Hate, which Shana mentioned, it's also linked in the city's uh, website. It's really the go-to resource for documenting what is happening. And unfortunately, um, as of um, last month, uh, it's been over 3,800 3, incidents that's been reported so far. And just some trends to highlight here, 6.2% um, of the incidents involve the elderly. Um, and we know the, the media report have really highlighted the, um, the incredibly violent uh, incidents against the elderly. And here um, we understand um, this is also the community that is least likely to access technology and to report. Um, so we need to continue to understand the impact um, on the elderly community as a whole. Um, we see also here in this data, as it foreshadows what happened in Atlanta um, a month ago, actually right, you know, the heels of when our, our last meeting was scheduled, that, you know, women are um, more in, impacted than men. Um, so the um, stated reason from the Atlanta shoot, uh, shooter that this is about, uh, this is not about race, but it's about, you know, sexual addiction. We understand that gender is heavily intersected here with race. Um, and so this is a very uh, alarming trend that uh, for some reason, women are more uh, targeted. Um, and within these um, incidents, we see um, a lot of them are verbal harassment, um, shunning, um, and unfortunately uh, rise to the uh, case of physical assault. And there's also incidents of workplace discrimination um, and online har harassment, which we saw here even in uh, the K-12 and the colleges here in San Diego. And uh, here are some uh, incidences that were highlighted in the media. Um, for unfortunately, you know, most recently the um, the six Asian women uh, that were among the eight that were killed in Georgia. Um, so, as how how did we um, respond um, as a community, especially here in in San Diego? So we worked closely with Stop API Hate to get the kind of uh, local um, level data, and here um, Pack Arts have uh, really done a good job in presenting. Uh, the San Diego level data. So um, in that nine month period, um, we see 42 reports of discrimination here in San Diego. Um, and again, uh, the patterns are very similar to the national uh, trends. Um, we have verbal harassment, shunning, uh, physical assault and online bullying. Uh, we also understand that these take place um, in a lot of businesses and public spaces. Um, and it's really um, just come to the fore that even uh, someone like me who, you know, have young kids and have elderly parents, you know, just afraid to even walk out the street. And as you can imagine how difficult that has been during the pandemic where we just need some fresh air, but even that basic um, action has been um, shouted in fear uh, for many in the AAPI community. And then um, as you see the breakdown on the demographics, um, we have seen discrimination against all the different ethnicities. Um, uh, and also here, again, the age, um, we have to take it with a grain of salt in terms of the online reporting aspect. Um, a lot of younger folks, but obviously we know it's happening to a lot of elderly. They might or may not be reporting yet. So that's something that we as a community and we also will ask you and as the commission to um, help us uh, spread the word and uh, really ask the elderly community to also take part in uh, reporting these incidents. And we also see, as Kent noted, um, even way before uh, lockdown, that business has declined. And unfortunately, till this day, uh, Asian owned businesses are still among the high, 
highest impacted uh, businesses. Um, and we see in, in San Diego here, uh, incident of a verbal harassment of an Uber driver. Um, we have a Filipina who was attacked um, in, in the um, trolley. And we have numerous uh, folks that have been um, told to go back uh, to China and blaming them for the coronavirus. And um, Sam, I hate to interrupt you, but I do want to make sure we have um, time for Tommy and then time for questions. Um, so if you could take a minute to wrap up, that would be great. Sure. Um, so yeah, actually, you already mentioned, you know, in addition to the recent HRC statement, we've had um, uh, resolutions both on the city and the county level. And we want to ask the general public to do these actions. But for the sake of time, I'll, I'll end by um, highlighting the memo that we've attached in the agenda, which um, we really wanted to get the input from the commission. And uh, if you can refer to that um, uh, PDF, um, the general um, recommendations we have is basically to follow up with the um, resolution that was passed. And that really um, highlighted the role of the HR Commission and how it can continue to work with our community uh, to promote reporting, uh, to increase the representation in the um, different boards and commissions um, to make sure language access is up to par and um, that people who are less likely to engage government can have a better access. Uh, to look at different ways that small businesses can continue to access relief and development funds, um, and then to work with the newly uh, cre uh, created Office of Equity um, and various CBOs and even the schools to do a lot of these things that we know it's really what we, what's the anecdote to this hate, um, which is uh, continued training um, to continue to uphold and celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage and culture and to educate the general public about history, just like Kent did uh, in the beginning here. Um, and lastly, you know, um, just to continue to work with the city uh, to implement the Welcoming San Diego plan, which has a lot of uh, intersections um, and alignment with um, the needs of the API community. So Thanks. I'm there and look forward to um, hearing everyone's thoughts. Thank you, Sam. And again, sorry uh, to have to cut you short. I do want to remind all of our commissioners, um, because I know it was a relatively lengthy meeting packet. Um, the memorandum that Sam's referencing is on page 24 of your meeting packet. Um, so if you wanted to take another look at it now before our Q&A uh, section, please go ahead and do that. Um, I am going to introduce Tommy Howe and give him an opportunity to speak before I open it up for questions. Tommy is a San Diego County Planning Commissioner and a 19 year resident of San Diego, having first arrived in 2002 as part of the inaugural air staff at FM 94.9. Tommy later hosted mornings at 91X, managed communications for the San Diego Surfrider chapter and currently serves as the coordinator for the Rewild Mission Bay campaign through the San Diego Audubon Society. He and his wife, Corey, and their dogs li have lived in Mira Mesa for the last eight years. Tommy. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for um, uh, having this presentation this evening. Thank you to Kent and Sam for, uh, for their presentation. It's exceptionally instructional. It passes along a lot of good information and um, there's a, a number of details in there that I, I think this commission can um, can really take and move forward with. And I, I, I think the letter that I'd sent to the commission on March 8th in some way builds upon what Kent and Sam were talking about. And if it's okay with the chair, I'd like to read my letter uh, into the record and maybe yes, set a little stage. Absolutely. It, and as you're doing that, I did want to just mention to everyone that that is on page 25 of your meeting packet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I wrote this, um, this was right after Channel 10 had reported on the incident on the San Diego trolley with uh, uh, an elderly Filipino woman being attacked. This was weeks after the, uh, the gentleman was shoved to the pavement and killed in San Francisco. And it was very, very clear at this point around the time, even before the January 6th insurrection, that we'd had a year essentially of, uh, of the president saying the most racist, 
awful things regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and leadership on down, when you open these kinds of Pandora's box and, and, and you, you set the kind of negative leadership that President Trump was doing, unfortunately, these are the results. And we're going to have to be dealing with these results for many, many months and many, many years to come. But that was essentially the place I was when I wound up writing this letter. But really what prompted it was a couple of personal matters that, that affected my neighbors. And I suppose I can address those during the Q&A afterwards. But at any rate, my letter reads uh, March 8th, 2021. With the alarming trend of hate and intimidation directed against our AAPI neighbors, since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially the spike in violence against elderly AAPI citizens around California and the US since the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, I'd like to ask the commission to increase its outreach to our local AAPI communities and related organizations throughout the city. Just as my neighbors and I in Mira Mesa are increasing our vigilance regarding anti-Asian violence and intimidation, I want to ensure the city is increasing its vigilance too. And I'd like to suggest the commission consider a series of hearings on the epidemic of anti-Asian hate as soon as it's safe to gather at city libraries and recreation centers for a thorough airing of local and potentially unreported incidents from neighborhood leaders and stakeholders. Similarly, I'd like to propose that the commission invite police, fire personnel, and other public safety services to be part of the dialogue to not only discuss specific hate incidents, but to consider the potential for cultural misunderstandings that may arise from language barriers or incomplete communication, which could discourage some elderly AAPI neighbors from reporting a hate-related or violent or intimidating incident. And as bad as the attack was on an elderly Filipino woman aboard the San Diego trolley last month, there may have been dozens of additional incidents of hate violence and intimidation over the last year that have affected our AAPI neighbors or gone unreported or unnoticed except by those involved. Stop AAPI hate recorded over two dozen incidents of anti-Asian hate throughout the county in 2020 alone. This is an opportunity for the city and the commission to enable a forum on this important matter and an opportunity for neighbors, policymakers, and city officials to discuss solutions as we maintain vigilance. Please let me know how I can assist in any of these efforts. Thank you for your kind consideration. Sincerely, Tommy Howe. Now, at the time in, uh, in early March, uh, a lot of the awareness about this was still building. This was uh, regrettably several weeks or so before the, uh, the attack in Atlanta. Now, I know I've been out with some of the San Diego police officers since then going to a number of businesses along Mira Mesa Boulevard, uh, reaching out to some of these business owners and letting them know that uh, they, they, they shouldn't feel uh, concerned about reaching out to officers. In fact, there are a number who speak a number of different languages that are pertinent to our community, Vietnamese, Korean, Tagalog. It's good to know those services are there and that many of our, our first responders are already on top of that. But I think having these hearings and having these meetings at different areas throughout the city are really gonna be able to encourage a number of our elderly residents to come forward who may feel concerns about uh, about shame, of, of asking for help, about, about admitting that something happened to them. But no matter how small an incident of intimidation may have been, at this point in history, it is important that it's on the record and that we're speaking about it and that Stop AAPI Hate is aware of it and that our first responders are aware of it. And they're sensitive to that if these incidents continue to occur uh, at the rate that they have been occurring and as random as they've been. So I, I suppose, uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks, and I'd be happy to go into question and answer with, uh, with Kent and Sam. Thank you, and thank you to all of our presenters. And I will uh, open it up for questions uh, from commissioners. I did want to mention, since I heard, I think all of our uh, panelists mentioned the importance of highlighting and encouraging the use of uh, the reporting tool, which is linked on our website. So I did make a note to myself um, that we could work with the city's communications teams uh, to potentially do some media relations around that, um, because I do think that's a really critical step, um, raising awareness that this tool is out there because it's important, A, that people report um, and that we have data, and then of course that we act on it. Um, I'm looking in the chat uh, you know, I, I actually see uh, Nicole's hand raised via oh, phone. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Commissioner Murray Ramirez. Uh, yes, uh, I I think we're all very appreciative of these, uh, these two presentations, uh, especially the historic part. You, you learn a lot uh, 
And I think we all did. Uh, I think it's just like with the black uh, African-American people think it's just recently you're talking 400 years of this type of hate. And also with the Asian Pacific Islander uh, community. That being said, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, the last presenter, are you uh, I noticed in your resume, you had mentioned uh, many things that you're involved in. My question is, are you involved or uh, a member or officer of any uh, of these Asian Pacific Islander organizations or the ones that recently uh, coalition organized? Uh, no, sir, I'm not. Most of my advocacy over the last 10 years has really been involved in um, environmental efforts or within the San Diego County Democratic Party. Uh, uh, oh, OK, thank you. Yes, also, uh, I uh, to the first presenters. The concern, I think we all, many of us are very aware of the Japanese American incarnation, but they, I, I like that you mentioned that they took property and land. Have they ever been uh, money ever given back from the government for that? Were they ever paid back for their losses? Mm -hmm. uh, to my knowledge, there is actually one, the, one of the few instances, if not the only one in history where reparations were given from the federal government. But Kent, do you have any specific knowledge about how that impacts um, San Diego's? I know there's a lot of San Diego Japanese American families. Yeah, I mean, in many cases, the reparations came decades, decades after, um, and even when many of the individuals who had first been inflicted um, and impacted had already passed, and and it was hard uh -huh. fought. And and even then, you know, nothing compares to the losses that they incurred Absolutely. in that time. So yeah. And one last thing. I think we're all aware of, especially uh, you gentlemen, that uh, within the African and American community and the Asian Pacific Islander community, sometimes there seems to be some uh, difference, especially with uh, the business owners. I think we all realize what happened in Los Angeles with the, the Korean uh, business owners. Is there has there been uh, attempts by your coalition or is it in planning to have more dialogue and and uh, discussions with the African-American community to kind of strengthen uh, ties between the two communities? Yeah, maybe maybe I can start on, on that front. I think as a part of the work for the San Diego Asian Pacific Islander Coalition over this last year is that we've recognized um, that as we're talking about hate being somewhat universal and impacting many communities, that our role is not just bringing awareness to this issue at this time, but to consider the work that we have to do to build solidarity with all communities who are impacted. That has been a pretty core part of our work over the last year. Um, and I think that kind of um, solidarity work is, is key to where we're sort of moving forward as well. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And Kent, please uh, keep us in the loop as you are holding uh, programs um, or working to do bridge building because we wanna be part of that and support those efforts. Uh, I do see quite a few commissioners would like to speak. Uh, I'd like to call on commissioner or uh, vice chair Canizales. Hi, um, thank you all uh, to all the presenters uh, for your for the information tonight. Um, I especially like the idea of having the commission go out into the community. It is something that we used to do. Um, we always felt that it was really important for us to go into the different council districts to make sure that the community is aware of the work we do. And so I think once things open up, that is definitely a priority. But I think more importantly, um, with everything that's gone on over the last year, I think it would be great for us to have almost a year long campaign against hate and really make that the focal point for our meetings over the next year. Um, and, and really to try to build bridges within our community, I think that's really important. And so um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to move in that direction moving forward. So again, thanks for the information. Thank you. Uh, and I do think that's a fantastic idea, a campaign against hate. And I'm wondering if you would like to lead that charge. I think if we could bring you know a few commissioners together to talk about that. I also, I'm sure Commissioner Gillies has lots of good ideas about uh, what a campaign against hate could look like, but I think it is absolutely the right thing for us to be doing right now. I know you have a lot on your plate, so I don't know, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, 
After never, May, um, I'll have a little bit more time. So I think it's something, um, especially during the summer where the school district is a little quiet. So I think maybe you could work on something over the next few months, have a plan and then present it to the commission. So I'm happy to work with any fellow commissioners on it. Is there anybody else that would like to work on a campaign against hate? I see Commissioner Higa, Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Gillies. Okay, thank Can you. Can I respond to Dorosa's point real quick? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, in the meantime, you know, we as the coalition would love to join forces with the commission and other stakeholders here. Uh, I just want to be uh, transparent about how grateful I am in this whole process in building solidarity and understanding that the Jewish community has our back, the Black community has our back. And there's so many ways that folks have just called me personally, reached out to offer support. And I know for example, Tammy has given us tremendous resources uh, in terms of training. Um, and we would love to work with this group, especially if there is a clear connection with the K-12 system, because I think that is the long game, is to really make sure we educate the next generation about this history. Um, so then we don't repeat it and we face it and we are able to understand uh, the solidarity is really important. Um, and then in the meantime, you know, before this campaign is launched, you know, we are actively working to educate a community and there's actually two sets of conversations that we're holding. Um, and we'd like to invite everyone to come take part, um, both in May during the APA Heritage Month. Um, so Ken and I will follow up to the commission to uh, invite everyone here uh, to join those two community conversations. Um, and then, um, um, love to use that as a platform to then uh, spawn more collaboration and more um, ways to build bridges. That sounds great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, let's see who's next. Commissioner Higa. Well, I just wanted to say, um, let me get myself on here. Um, when I was listening to Tommy, by the way, I had written some information about what I wanted to ask and it was right on target about um, organizing the community. And one of the topics that came out in some other, organ other organizations that I work with on this topic was, are the, is the city targeting community leaders? Because when we come to reporting, we found that we're, we're, the Asian community are not reporting for some reason, and there's a lot of reasons. So because we know that, are we looking at encouraging community leaders and who they are and uh, creating um, and educating um, the community? And also are the city um, giving any funding to do all these work that you're mentioning? Um, uh, facilities, available facilities, available funding to do this. And the last thing I wanted to mention was the Human Relations Commission a couple of years back was really involved in the human trafficking. And uh, a lot of the commissioners who are involved in the committee created this um, signs and also stickers with the 800 number on trafficking. And I thought about this, and we're not just talking about API or Asian hate, we're talking about all hate crimes. And it was really successful that they had these stickers, the 1-800 number or whatever it is, and they put it in bathrooms, bars, and all these things that they, um, where the community gather, but in a safe area. Um, I looked at the statistic that um, the other two presenters had were 42% were in um, organizing or buildings um, that were causing hate. And I'm thinking, this is not just the publicity of um, calling an 800 number is not just for the people to um, call the number, but it also gives a message to the haters that we're not gonna tolerate this and there is ways to report this. So I'm thinking like in this subcommittee, we could come up with some of these things and follow some of the, the uh, guidance that the human trafficking subcommittee that we had that was very successful and they presented with the mayor to the city their plan and I think and I envision something like this where um, Dolores and the group can come up with and have an ongoing and not just a one-shot deal. 
I think that's a great idea. And I jotted down a note about that because I think absolutely. So just to provide a little context um, with human trafficking, it was, I believe, a state law that required all businesses to post signs on reporting on human trafficking. And wouldn't it be amazing, maybe it would be a city ordinance requiring all businesses to post signage around reporting hate crimes. So let's work on it. Let's let's see what we can do And fantastic idea, Commissioner Higa. I am looking at the time. We are running a few minutes behind. I do see that Commissioner Gillies, Tom and Thomas uh, would like to speak. Um, I'll ask if you can keep it brief, please. Uh, Commissioner Gillies. Yes, very brief. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So I just want to say further to the conversation about not reporting hate crimes. I think that you all probably know that the FBI estimates that about 82% of hate crimes are never reported, and that goes across all communities. And I think that uh, the San Diego Hate Crimes Coalition, one of our goals is to go into communities and teach about what is a hate crime, what is a hate incident, and how to report it. And so once we all get back into the real world, and I've spoken to Sam and Ken about this separately, but I think also with the help of this commission, if we can spend some time going into communities, the libraries or the you know places that, um, meet people where they are and have those conversations to educate, it would be really helpful. And there's a lot of great people that can do that work. So um, I just think that's a plan for the future. Fantastic, thank you. And Commissioner Thomas? Hi, um, I'm Tootie and thank you guys for presenting. Really appreciated everything you said. I wanted to make sure that we all understand also that API, the API community is not monolithic. There are so many different varying cultures within that uh, group. So um, we have to recognize that first so we know how to do our outreach, but also to recognize how each group responds to outreach, basically. Um, within the uh, business district that I manage, um, we have the Vietnamese uh, Little Saigon District, which is a culturally recognized district. And there is major distrust of the go government with that group and um, any associated bodies that work with the government and also uh, within the Burmese cultures also. So I, I think we really have to pay attention to that. I have two questions. What kind of individual outreach is being done to these various communities, to the immigrant groups, and to refugee individuals through any one of your groups? Sam or? Yeah, maybe I can speak to that. I think I think the goal of the coalition as a result is we understand that, that, that our community is not monolithic. And I, and I think you you have you hit sort of a, a big point on the head for us, which is is um, you know, we've already heard from folks who have expressed concern about being asked to come out and share their trauma in some kind of public format, because that is difficult. I mean, they already feel like they're being asked to prove that this is actually happening. Um, and there have been cases in public forums, even online, where members of the community have expressed that they have tried to report something and they've either been ignored or, um, you know, really don't feel comfortable with sharing it um, unless they're really given an anonymous standpoint. And I think that might be very different in various communities, especially if it's immigrant refugee communities versus those who, you know, maybe have in different interactions from a business standpoint, et cetera. So I think for us, our work um, from a coalition standpoint is very targeted. You know, we have individual organizations that represent um, particular parts of the community and we wanna work with them on how we can best reach their members. Um, and, and then I think beyond that, I think that's why in the action items that were put together in the memo for this evening, I think we were looking more even beyond just thinking about how we respond to hate as we know it now, but to think about what kinds of ways we need to develop resources to reach um, different elements of the community. You know, language being a, a, a significant barrier. Um, and then looking at other resources that we can bring to the table to have conversations. As Tammy said, I think looking at ways to offer training would be um, significant as well. So I think as the commission looks moves forward and thinks about 
organizing some kind of campaign, um, we would certainly caution that you think about how, you know, what the reaction might be for various communities and neighborhoods um, as they may all perceive it differently. One last thing on this is that two years ago, we worked with the Aja Project, which is an arts group mm -hmm. in uh, the mid city. And we did Little Saigon stories where we told the uh, stories of neighbors uh, within the Vietnamese community. And this might be a good way to do it also um, because you can capture it one-on-one -on -one and then share it with, with everyone. So it's not really asking people to sit down with an officer that they don't know and to make a report or to sit down with people that they don't know. It was a very successful um, uh, product that we made and we carried it out throughout the um, boulevard uh, to bring it into different communities who maybe have been living side by side with um, our Vietnamese neighbors. Um, that goes to my last question, which is how can we use and support church groups, business association and clubs to do that constant outreach? If I may jump in here, um, I think what Kent said earlier about coalition is that it is still forming. We're still trying to make sure that we have representation, not just uh, in terms of language and ethnicity, but across sectors. So those uh, three uh, different important community um, anchors are definitely folks that we've already worked with, uh, whether informally or informally, and we definitely want to continue to reach out and build those uh, connections with faith leaders and other community-based organizations so that we could do this better together. Um, and I think there's no better moment now in a crisis for us to really uh, come together, which to your point has been difficult in the past. And coalitions like, like ours, frankly, have come and go uh, because it is really difficult to organize across the AAPI banner. Um, so those are actually the trusted community leaders when it comes to faith leaders, uh, health professionals, uh, teachers. Um, so definitely those are the folks, you know, beyond just language access are culturally competent and are the, the, the trusted messengers that we uh, are trying to embody, you know, as the coalition and also to make sure that we represent all the different communities uh, within the AAPI uh, community. Thank you. And thank you. I know I'm Commissioner Murray Ramirez, I, I was told you have your hand raised, so we'll get to you. I do want to um, thank our panelists very much for answering our questions and thank my fellow commissioners uh, for all of your great ideas and suggestions. I think we could talk about this um, for hours and start putting a plan together. And I really am excited about the momentum um, behind this and also want to really uh, acknowledge uh, the memorandum that Sam and Kent have provided, which offers a really great roadmap uh, for some of our next steps. Um, and I did uh, receive a message uh, from Commissioner Higa asking if Sam or Kent might be willing to join us um, as part of this new working group um, as we start thinking about uh, our campaign against hate generally, um, but I think particularly around um, some of the items in your memorandum. Uh, would you be open to that, Kent or Sam? Yes. Fantastic. And then the, my other question for commissioners is, is there anyone willing uh, to be a liaison with the uh, API uh, coalition? I don't know if I see any hands raised. Commissioner Thomas, that would be, that would be great. Um, and I think if you don't have Kent and Sam's information, we'll make sure you have it. Um, but it would be great to you know, start uh, making that stronger connection. Um, so thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Tommy and to Sam and to Kent. We are glad you are with us um, and we will continue the conversation and more importantly, doing the work together. Uh, and Commissioner Murray Ramirez, I know you had a hand up. Yes, uh, thank you again. But one of the most important things I think we all know is representation. Uh, Councilman Chris Cates' term is up, and uh, I know that it took many years to get a Asian Pacific Islander elected to uh, our city council. And uh, 
Chris Kate was fortunate enough uh, to end that long drought of not having a representation. I know that we're not political and can't get political, but I would urge all the commission members to look into the upcoming seventh district race, look at the candidates, uh, because we have an opportunity to me. It's a, uh, there are some qualified, very qualified Asian Pacific Islanders that are running uh, for office. And I think uh, it would behoove all of you to look them up, find out about them and to support, because I think to have uh, and not have an Asian Pacific Islander voice on our city council would be j just uh, just terrible. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our next item, uh, which is on hate crimes and violent extremism. As a reminder, we've made this a standing agenda item. Uh, and so I invite Commissioner Gillies, uh, if you'd like to share uh, a brief report on violent extremism. Sure, very brief. Um, I got some numbers from our district attorney's office and our city attorney's office just to update everyone. And I think maybe I will always preface this report by saying that we have to keep in mind that hate against one is hate against all. And um, it's not all about the numbers also because even one Hate crime is too many for our community. So just want to share that. Um, so through the district attorney's office for this year to date, um, 12 cases were filed and 10 ended up being filed as hate crimes. Of those 10, uh, nine were based on race and I can break that down for you. Uh, four were uh, targeting the black community, four were targeting the Hispanic community, and one was targeting the AAPI community. And then the last case was uh, based on religion, and that was targeting the Jewish community. From the city attorney's office, they have three that are on their books right now. Two are still being processed, so I don't have the details. And the other one was a uh, race-based hate crime. So um, I, I just wanna share that I think, again, the importance of letting people know what a hate crime versus a hate incident is and how to report it. Because as we say, data drives policy and the more data we have, the better we can put resources towards these things. So. That's it. I'll give you my time back, Shana. Thank you very much. Uh, and appreciate you sharing these numbers with us every month. And I was just reminded uh, that I didn't ask for public comment uh, for this agenda item. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, we will move on to the next item, which is mayor's office. Uh, public official comment, and I believe we have Matthew Gordon with us. Matthew. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to you and HRC uh, commissioners. Uh, my name is Matthew, Matthew Gordon, Director of Appointments to Boards and Commissions for Mayor Todd Gloria. Uh, quick shout out to your newest commissioner, Ms. Ricky Brown. Congratulations once again. How you doing? Um, a couple of updates. I'm going to keep mine real brief, uh, particularly with regard to uh, the HRC uh, nomination of uh, Tyler Duncan. Um, we're expecting uh, his official appointment by the mayor uh, by the end of this week. Um, I'll keep Farhat posted and, and uh, Madam Chair posted on that. Um, I am looking at getting him docketed before council by mid-May. Um, as you may or may not know, um, budget hearings is coming up in early May. Uh, so the council will be conducting budget business. Um, with regard to the uh, Matthew. youth commissioner, May I ask just a quick one on that? Does that mean if, uh, that- If I may finish, I'm, I'm gonna be quick. And sure, sure, absolutely. 
ask me any question you want. Uh, with regard to the Youth Commission, um, uh, we haven't made that announcement just yet. Um, we anticipate making that announcement in the next couple of weeks, um, as I envision it. Um, uh, I see a member of that commission uh, 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 working with this commission. Um, so the focus is uh, to uh, get the youth on the board um, and um, they'll conduct their business like your average uh, board and or commission and they'll work with the chair of this commission um, as I envision it. With regard to um, uh, an HRC, an official executive director for the HRC, um, we're still having all discussions about that. Um, my, uh, just keeping it real with this commission, um, it may be some time before uh, we can make that happen, but the discussions are still ongoing and finding um, ways uh, to um, address that per the Muni code, since it's specified uh, within the Muni code. Uh, I also want to mention specifically for the purposes of this meeting and uh, thank, uh, I thank the gentleman from uh, the API Coalition for their, um, for their presentation, um, just, just so this commission uh, is aware. Um, had a meeting with one of their representatives um, on uh, ways to increase API representation on boards and commissions. As a part of uh, uh, Mayor Gloria and this administration's commitment to diversifying our boards and commissions, uh, we're making efforts to speak with uh, community stakeholders and organizations, uh, particularly with regards to the AAPI community and get uh, more um, representation uh, on these boards and commissions. Off the top of my head, we just made uh, an appointment of uh, Lu uh, Louis Nguyen uh, to the SD SERS uh, Board of Administration that oversees the city's uh, city employees uh, uh, pension portfolio. So we're definitely excited and proud to see him uh, serve on that board. Last but not least, there has been movement with regard to the logistics of bringing back um, awards and certificates for uh, the HRC. Uh, as I understand it, the HRC, the HRC has the practice of um, uh, recognizing uh, uh, members in the community with certificates of recognition. Um, and I'll flesh out the details with Farhad and uh, Madam Chair, uh, but we'll, we'll be working with uh, the community engagement team on that. And um, I, I know there have been questions on that as well. So uh, with that, that'll conclude my report and I'm more than happy to address any of your questions or concerns. Thank you, Matthew. We're glad to have you here tonight and thank you for your updates. Um, I am wondering in terms of the appointment of Tyler Duncan, you mentioned uh, that you're hoping that would happen in May. Uh, is it likely that would be before our May meeting um, or not? Um, to my understanding, your meetings are, are every third Wednesday, correct? Yeah, the next um, one's May 19th. Okay, so mid-May would be May 18th on a Tuesday. Um, I'm not sure that he would be able to be an official um, member the next day um, because he has to take the oath of office with, if confirmed by the council, uh, he'll have to take the oath of office and um, uh, start his onboarding process. Um, so we are targeting mid-May, it's just due to uh, the budget season, that's the earliest date that I can get in before council. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And is that our last vacancy? Uh, off the top of my head, yes. Very um, good. I know that this commission has been, and I, I appreciate it as a black man personally, 
um, you know, wanting uh, black representation. So we're almost at the finish line here. Good, so. good. Yes, no, and we had many vacancies for a long time um, and then the absence of representation from the black and African-American community. So just thank you um, to you, Matthew, um, and to all of the commissioners for really getting the word out there and encouraging people um, to join the, the commission. So very happy about that progress. I do see Commissioner uh, Detsky weil uh, would like to speak uh, and after her uh, Vice Chair Kanazales. Hi, Matthew. Um, thanks for being here. I have a question about um, Tyler Duncan. Do you have any information on his background? And also I have a question about the Youth Commissioner. Where are they looking to find a youth? Um, is it from high schools in San Diego, college, or what, what are the, you know, the, the um, issues around selecting someone? Uh, good questions. And before I answer that, um, with regard to the HRC vacancy, I believe there is one more for Council District 4, just to clarify that, I believe. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I do have information on uh, Mr. Duncan. He is a, a nominee of Council District 7. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to share this information with you here this evening. Um, I would, would encourage you to reach out to the Council uh, uh, District 7's office for more information. But yes, I do have information on him. Um, uh, 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 I had a rules committee meeting presentation earlier today and council member uh, Raul Campillo uh, brought up uh, his nomination. Um, he himself has been pushing uh, for his nomination in, in addition to this commission. So uh, we're gonna do, do everything that we can to see that he, he does get appointed. With regard to the youth commission, we're not there yet. So it's gonna be um, uh, a couple of things here. Each council district has uh, two seats that they can fill, plus the mayor's office. So however, um, each council office decides to do their nominating process, vetting process, that's for them. For our office, we have our process. Uh, we have begun to reach out to um, uh, community stakeholders, uh, uh, youth-oriented organizations um, to begin our process. Uh, but again, it's up to each council office and uh, 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 it's up to the respective council members to, um, you know, map out their process and what it, what that will entail. Thank you. And just to um, make sure it's clear, there is a new youth commission being formed and of that new commission, uh, there will be a liaison um, to this one. So we had hoped, oh, well, we want a youth member, but even better than that, there will be a whole youth commission, which is exciting. So it's not new, it's already on the books, it's just been inactive. Oh, okay, well, so relaunching, like, reforming, actually having people serve on it. Yeah, it's more like a revival, a relaunch, whichever term you want thank to Thank you, thank you. And Vice Chair Canizales? Yes, um, thanks for um, being here today. One of the questions that um, you brought up and we would um, had a couple of commissioners ask about uh, were the commendations, but also um, in the past commissioners were given business cards. And um, that was another one of the questions I know that um, we had asked Farhat to, to look into. Um, I know specifically uh, there are a few commissioners that have requested cards. Um, I'm not sure if it has to do with budget, but um, I, I asked about a template so that if a commissioner did want to create a business card as they're out in the community, um, we would be provided uh, an approved um, template. I'm sure some of the commissioners would prefer to just have the city um, have each of us get cards, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Has that been brought to your attention? Um, and, and really it's, um, with the commendations, I know that is something that we had always done in the past, so. Yes, uh, and good question. Um, I'm trying to 
find the words without confusing <laughs> the commission uh, as it stands officially. So to answer your question, yes, it's a budget thing. You have to budget to, um, uh, in, in this instance, print out and provide uh, business cards. Um, the current structure of boards and commissions right now is kind of funky. So financially speaking and budget wise, um, the HRC isn't housed under boards and commissions. Um, I believe it's housed under, I believe, I want to say neighborhood services, but I'll double check that uh, for you. Um, so I can't specifically speak to whether or not um, uh, my office can fund, uh, appropriately fund for these business cards because literally uh, Human Relations Commission from a budget standpoint and financial standpoint is not housed under the umbrella of boards commissions. I'm not sure why that is. Um, having discussions with the finance department, personal department, so on and so forth, coming to find out that the, all the accounting information is not housed under the office boards of commission. So it's not my call. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope you follow me <laughs> there because the situation is kind of funky. We're, 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 uh, uh, this office has experienced a couple of restructures. Uh, it used to be housed under the Office of Boards of Commission under the previous administration for whatever reason. Um, they took it out under from under Boards of Commissions into a whole other department. Um, so hopefully that answers your question to that. Uh, I yeah, and I understand that, and I won't belabor this because I know we have a, a little time. But I think uh, one of the other questions would be then to go to the communications office for a template, an approved template, um, so that a commissioner could get an approved template. Um, so anyway, um, I think we'll continue down that route. Thanks for the information today. For sure, and our office is all is on standby, ready and willing to help. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. We appreciate you being here. And just one last thing. So you, I think, said that you are working on or looking into the executive director. Um, is there any news to share or anything we can expect to hear at the next meeting? No, not even at the next meeting, to be honest, to, to be honest with you all. Okay. Um, there are and I just want discussions, though. Okay, and I just want to share just for the record that our staffing is really limited um, and that we do have significant capacity issues that make it very difficult to advance our work. Um, so anything that could be done to provide additional staffing to support the commission um, is something that I know is, well, important to me and I believe important to all of our commissioners. Thank you again, Matthew, for being here. And I'm gonna turn it over to another Matthew, although I think I forgot again to ask for public comment on this item. So any public comment um, on uh, Matthew Gordon's item? Okay, now we will move on to Matthew Griffith, um, who will share an update on the Office of Race and Equity. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and uh, the rest of the commissioners. So, so uh, good to see that there was a quorum that was met so the meeting could be had this week as much anticipation uh, leading up to this meeting. I also want to thank the uh, panelists who have presented on the information. Um, I'm so glad to hear that not only was the data presented, but also the historical information that went with that as well, um, which is extremely important. Um, as far as the Office on Race and Equity update, um, the uh, recruitment process, uh, it, 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 it's still open, the seat is still open, um, actively recruiting a nationwide search. Uh, so I do apologize that I can't give an update outside of that, but that is still ongoing. Um, and uh, I believe I also have some information uh, that was requested as far as the Black Advisory Board uh, that has already been formed. Uh, the members have uh, had a few meetings um, and most recent, um, we met uh, the mayor and the Black Advisory Board met to discuss the uh, mayor's proposed budget and uh, the, um, of course, the Black Empowerment Plan that was also released, in, in including the police reform plan. 
that has also been released as well. Um, again, uh, the Black Empowerment Plan is a working document. This is not something that is set in stone. That is a end-all, be-all plan. This is something that uh, will be uh, receiving other items as we continue to move forward through this administration. In addition to that, it is also not limited to um, just Black individuals. Uh, it is also not limited to just uh, certain districts. Certain questions have come up where individuals believe that this is just for District 4, 8, and 9. Whereas we know Black individuals live in all districts in the, in the city of San Diego. In addition to that, also uh, minority uh, demographics live throughout the entire city as well. And that many of the items that have been recognized or uh, brought up in the Black Empowerment Plan also will uh, provide empowerment for other demographics. So uh, just wanted to make sure that information has been uh, provided. Uh, again, I wanna make sure I'm respecting the commission's time. I believe that is uh, uh, the, pretty much the end of my report and I can take questions at this moment. And again, I uh, just wanna say how thankful I am to have been given the opportunity to present to you guys for the first time this year and look forward to uh, ex 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 pretty much forming a, a well working relationship as we uh, go forward through our administration. Thank you, Matt. And I'm wondering, so now that there is the Black Empowerment Plan and seems to be a lot of movement um, on this and related issues, um, if we can invite you to come back on a monthly basis, assuming there are updates to share, um, because I'm excited to see this work um, moving forward. And we'd love to know, A, what's happening and B, how we can help. Of course. Um, I will say this. I cannot guarantee that I'll be here on a monthly basis because I do oversee three council districts. Um, I, I actually am, I have my other laptop waiting yes. for another well, meeting. Or at least us. even if you could share a written report with course, us, just some information course. so we know what's happening Definitely. would be fantastic. And I do have, so I did reach out um, to Liz Barrett um, in HR who's been involved in the search um, for the uh, Chief Equity Officer, the Director of the Office in Race and Equity. And I did just want to share with everybody, she shared a few dates. Um, she said that they are holding interviews the week of May 10th um, and are hoping um, to be able to offer a candidate the position, hopefully the end of May um, or maybe the beginning of June um, and hopefully having uh, that really critical uh, city staff member in place by June. And just wanna remind everyone, this is something that was called for a year ago in June, something this commission has been pushing for. Um, and we are happy that again, like with so many other issues, we are getting close to the finish line, um, but did wanna share that update. Does anyone have any questions for Matt before we move on to our next item? Okay, well, thank you again, Matt, and please keep us in the loop and, and let us know how we can work with and, and support you. I will, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and our next item is on revised bylaws. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, I will turn it over to Commissioner Detsky weil um, and also Vice Chair Conizales. Hi, everybody. Um... We met with uh, Bill Gersten, who is in the city attorney's office, to discuss some of the issues that we had with the bylaws and sent him a copy, the latest copy of the revised bylaws for him to comment on. He did send back some comments and we're in the midst of trying to find a, a time to meet again. I think we're meeting again on Monday at three o'clock and that was just finalized today. So. Um, I'll, I'll probably give him some feedback. We'll probably give him some feedback and, and discuss some more of the, uh, of the issues about the bylaws. Dolores, did you have anything to add? Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, that's great news about the youth commissioner because it, does not, it, it is not in our bylaws to have a youth commissioner. However, it is in the bylaws that we have um, an executive director. Um, so that is something I think that everybody needs to be aware of, it's in the municipal code. And what Bill is doing is really looking at the municipal code and matching it with the bylaws and removing things that don't necessarily have to be there. Um, so I think moving forward, once the bylaws are done, we'll be able to start looking at operating practices, um, 
you know, to, to reflect some of the um, practices that we're trying to uh, move forward with. And one of the big issues that is in there has to do with mediation, although we haven't had a lot of um, mediation um, opportunities over the last uh, couple of years. One of the questions that is going to come up is about training um, for all of us. And so that's another um, item that I know Bill is looking into. But um, anyway, I want to also just thank Faye for a lot of work that she's done on the bylaws and Commissioner Rizzo um, for attending as well. So we're, we're moving forward. It's just um, trying to get together all at yeah. the same time. Um, one yeah. other thing I'll say is it is um, ideal and it is written up that we should have as much diversity as we can on the commission. So that is something we've always strived to do and continue to do so. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you both for your work and thank you again to Commissioner Rizzo as well. Um, I did wanna mention and we can come back to it maybe at the next meeting in terms of training around mediation, I did have an opportunity um, to speak to someone uh, from the US Department of Justice's Community Relations Service um, and he has offered to provide guidance, support, training, um, one of the core services they provide is mediation um, on the particular issues um, that might come before us. Um, so he could be a resource and that office could be a resource for us, which I was very happy to hear. Um, moving on, our next item is on external relations. Commissioner Canizales. Thank you. Um, so a couple months ago now, uh, we, uh, Shane and I met with Perrette uh, Godwin, who is in the communications office, and she's really helpful and wanting to work with us on a variety of activities. And so one of the activities um, that we will be able to work with her on is providing information for next door. That's something that she will start to do, um, is to post all of our meetings on next door. Uh, she found that that's one of the most successful ways to communicate. Um, with the community. Uh, we also encouraged um, her to, uh, she encouraged us to send out press releases and uh, more importantly for us to really start to focus on different activities throughout the month um, or throughout the year. And to that end, um, I've created a Google Doc and I'm hoping that um, each commissioner, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in the chat, each commissioner will have an opportunity to fill that in. Um, so I'll just wait till I'm done. I'll, I'll put it in there uh, and then we could go over it. But basically, um, for example, March was Women's History Month. And if there was an activity going on, one of, the, uh, one of us could go to the, you know, to the, the meeting and represent um, the commission with if we don't have business cards, but at least with the commendation. Um, I know uh, Godwin Commissioner Higa mentioned something about a badge. I still have my HRC badge, but we all used to have badges and, and well, I never had business cards. But um, so really just to get out in the community at some point. And so I'll share the Google Doc and if you could, it's for everybody, it's for us to just fill in um, information about different activities you know about. But I think it's important to also get information to Farhat. The document is, real, uh, is really an annual plan to look at what we could do in June for Pride or what we could do in October for uh, Latino Heritage Month or in January. So, um, so I take a look at that. And I'll, as I said, I'll put it in the chat. Um, and I think the other thing um, which I'm really excited about, I had a very nice conversation with um, Commissioner uh, Marie Ramirez about uh, moving forward with the award ceremony. It's an event that we used to have, hold at the library. I helped chair it one year. Um, and so we talked about asking for volunteers um, to serve on the committee uh, for the recognition event. And it was usually held in November. So I'm hoping things will be open. Um, but also we talked about including some of our past um, commissioners, uh, some of the folks that had been involved in planning the event. Um, so Dion I can't remember, Brown, I think, um, and um, Joel, 
I, I don't remember their last names on the top of my head. Family and okay. Yeah. And so they were really involved in the planning of the event. It was a beautiful event in the library. And so it'd be wonderful if we could replicate that. Um, so I know that some of you might have attended that in the past. And I think that's it. I can't really see the agenda and everything. Um, are there any questions? No. And what, is there anyone else that is interested in oh, joining yeah. Vice Chair Canizales and Commissioner Murray Ramirez on our awards uh, celebration committee? Okay, well, I'm sure as we get closer to November, we will be asking for everybody's help um, to support the event and encourage um, nominations for awards. And I did want to just note um, that uh, in reference to uh, my comments earlier about um, the city attorney uh, letting me know that we can't use our template on extremism, um, that we are able, um, he says, we all have free speech and we may all issue statements individually. Um, and in those statements, you may reference um, offices um, or appointments you hold, um, but the commission, I could not speak on behalf of the commission, but we can all speak individually as commissioners. So I did wanna um, share that with regard to our external relations work. And I do, I'm trying to go back and forth to the chat. Um, I see uh, Commissioner Molig would like to speak. Yeah, I just want to add, I'm going to sound like the broken record, but as we move towards those name tags and business cards really being sensitive to including all pronouns, I see there are some of us have our pronouns on our website, not all of them are on there yet. Um, but that's a piece that's going to be just important as we do that forward facing to the community. Thank you, thank you. I think our the work we do to model best practices is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you for continuing to remind us of that. Uh, I'm looking to see, uh, Commissioner Rizzo. Along the mediation training front, just a reminder that, you know, I belong to West Coast Resolution Group in my profession. So we are we're associated with the National Conflict Resolution Center. And I'm sure if we need some mediation training, you know, talk to me, I'm sure we can figure something out. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our next item. I like to turn it over to Farhat. Well, I guess before I do, so we're going to talk about uh, global and immigrant affairs. Is there any public comment on item 10? Okay. Seeing none. Farhat. Sure. So I, I will keep this brief, um, but as you all know, a lot has happened in the last two months. Um, so I apologize in advance if it's not as brief as I thought it might be. Um, the mayor was at the border in March witnessing how MPP asylum seekers are being processed into San Diego. And uh, we all continue to track that situation very closely. The UNHCR Deputy High Commissioner uh, also visited San Diego in March and met with the mayor. So he's, he's been busy on, on that front. Um, as you all know, the, the city, county, federal government and service providers are working together on the humanitarian response related to unaccompanied children in San Diego. The response is being managed by the, by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services and specifically their Administration for Children and Families. And then within that, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, the city is allowing use of the Convention Center through, through mid-July. All of the service providers are contracted through the federal government. Um, Rady Children's Hospital is the me medical provider on site. South Bay Community Services, SBCS is the main provider for case management and other services. KIND is providing legal services. The San Diego County Office of Education is providing educational services. Um, and there are other organizations like the YMCA who are also providing support. So we continue to, to track that as well. Um, you may have seen the news regarding the refugee resettlement numbers recently. Um, initially, the administration mentioned that they would maintain the Trump administration's number of 15,000. Um, and now they're saying that they'll issue a revised number in May. We are keeping an eye on that and are supportive of, of obviously raising the cap and promoting refugee resettlement in the San Diego region as the welcoming city that we are. Uh, my last note is just to follow the welcoming San Diego um, 
plat social media platforms and, and to share with others. Um, that's where we are continuing to provide links to resources, updates, um, and other, other uh, issues and resources that are relevant to the immigrant, refugee, and asylum community. So would be grateful for you all to follow and for us to follow you, obviously, um, to continue to try to get the word out and promote kind of more robust communication um, as, as we can. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Farha. And I don't know if I have the numbers exactly correct, but I did want to provide some context to the refugee resettlement numbers. I believe that under President Obama, um, the numbers were as high as I think 110,000. Is that correct? I don't know if we ever got there, but I think that's what was authorized. That sounds right, but I'd have to check to confirm. Yeah. So just to provide that context, right? So that 15,000 compared to over 100,000 um, in terms of people that we are welcoming um, to the country. I'm looking in the chat to see if there are any questions or comments. I don't see any. Any, any questions for Farhat before we move on to the next item? Okay, thank you. And our next item is uh, the chair's report. I want to express my gratitude as always for everybody's contributions um, to the work that we do both tonight and between meetings. Um, I do also want to remind commissioners that didn't have a chance to present this evening or haven't participated yet in any of our commission working groups. Um, please bring issues that matter most to you and the communities you represent to our next meeting. You can email Farhat, uh, Commissioner, Vice uh, Chair Canizales and myself to request an item be added to a future agenda. Um, I do ask that you please provide two weeks notice before the next meeting as we start getting agendas together about that far in advance. I also wanted uh, to share an update on the communities of concern language. As you'll recall, uh, we sent a letter to Sandag um, asking that they no longer use uh, that language. Um, and Commissioner Conazales and I met with their director of planning, their sustainable communities manager, their director of strategic communication, and the senior planner who oversees their social equity work on March 15th. Um, and it turns out um, a bit to our dismay that Sandag Social Equity Working Group met and discussed our request, but decided not to formally call for Sandag to stop using the term communities of concern. Sandag staff said they are committed to not using the term in the appendix of their new consolidated plan and will use more precise alternative language depending on the context. Um, and they said that they intend to send us a letter uh, affirming this and affirming their intent. So not exactly what we were looking for, um, but they do agree that um, there are more precise uh, words that can be used to describe the specific communities that are being referenced and we'll do that moving forward. Um, I also wanted to update everyone. You should have received an email um, about a month ago um, on the Sarah High School renaming issue. So since we last met in February, the name of Sarah High School has officially been changed to Canyon Hills High School. Um, and I don't know if I'm gonna get this pronunciation right, um, slash Matt Kwatap Kunkun High School. Um, and that was thanks in no small part to the advocacy of this commission and in particular Commissioner Beltran. The Human Relations Commission's support was referenced in a UT article about the name change, along with a quote from our letter to the district. Um, and the last, or actually I have two I guess, last updates. Um, one is on the US Department of Justice, which I referenced yesterday. I met with their conciliation specialist who assists cities and counties with addressing community conflicts on the basis of race, gender, religion, 
et cetera. And they work with commissions like ours to facilitate dialogues, mediate confrontations, um, and educate the community and are very open to working with us. I mentioned that we have very limited staff capacity and they said they want to help in whatever ways possible, um, whether it's holding community forums um, or supporting mediation. Um, and they're also open specifically to working with us to host a police and community relations program if we're interested um, following the Chauvin trial um, to bring our community together. And so I'm wondering if there's interest in that or any other um, related community forum. And if you're interested in working on that um, with the Department of Justice Community Relations Service. Well, I will leave it to everybody to think about, but again, they are willing um, to do a lot of the work to provide you know, description of the program, to outline it, um, develop agendas, even help facilitate. Um, so to really help us with some of the heavy lifting. So again, I will put that out there for us to think about as we, but as we think about wanting to do more in the community um, and having limited bandwidth, they could be a great partner to us. Um, and then lastly, um, I did want to share uh, that we sent a letter to council, you'll remember, um, condemning hate and extremism, supporting the resolution um, that uh, Commissioner Gillies and the ADL championed. Um, and I'm also very happy to share that that resolution passed on March 11th. So I think those are all of my updates. And now I'm going to turn it over to each of you, fellow commissioners, uh, for your updates. And I do have a note um, in the agenda um, for Commissioners Beltran and Purcell, if you have any updates um, on COVID-19 vaccine access. Would either of you like to share? I'd like to share. This is Commissioner Beltran. Um, thank you, Madam Commissioner Hazen, for that recognition on um, the work with San Diego Unified School District and Kanat Kohan on the changing of um, Sarah High School to Matkwetuk Kun Kun. Um, so um, with the immunization outreach, I spoke with Griselda Ramirez from Nora Vargas's office. Um, we talked about making vaccines more accessible to um, our more vulnerable communities. So um, the discussion was to expand the Promotora project and to do more outreach to make more walk-in um, scheduling available at various sites and then to also do community partnerships with different organizations different um like medical organizations i'm currently working with san diego american indian health center i'm, I'm not working at the county anymore i'm working with um, ihs so um our clinic has a certain amount of vaccine family health has a certain amount of vaccine um, La Maestra and San Isidro Health have a certain amount of vaccine. So what we're trying to do is um, coordinate pop-up clinics and vaccine outreach to provide vaccine to our most vulnerable populations at times which working families um, can, can receive vaccine on weekends when they can receive vaccine. So um, we're working very hard to make vaccine more accessible and um, you know just to provide that equity. And um, Griselda Ramirez has been very, very cooperative and very encouraging. So um, those are the developments so far when it comes to vaccine outreach. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I am noticing, I'm trying to monitor the chat and watch the agenda and all of you. Um, I see that we have a few of you who have asked to speak. Um, and so as we go around and share commissioner reports, I will ask that you share, if you've asked to speak, that you share your comments then. And I'm going to go through alphabetically um, to give everybody a chance to share. Uh, Commissioner Brown. I have nothing to share. Okay. Commissioner Canizales. I pass. Commissioner Detsky-Weil. Um, I wanted to ask if we could get an update on what's been going on with the um, county HRC. Does anyone have an update on that? Um, Commissioner um, Nicole Murray. 
perhaps. I don't know if Commissioner Murray Ramirez says, but I can tell you, I know, I don't know if he's still with us, but our panelist, uh, Sam Choi, I believe is on that commission and might be able to share a brief update. I don't know, Sam, if you're still with us or not, um, and if you can share. Sure. Yes, uh, sure. Um, so uh, recently the uh, board in the county has uh, officially um, voted the permanent um, chair and vice chair. Um, and also um, there's been a hire at the County Office for Equity and Racial Justice. And um, trying, to think, trying to think through what happened recently. Um, we also had a similar conversation there on um, anti-hate campaign. And also we had a presentation on um, the issue of anti-Asian racism as well. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely very uh, optimistic about um, what might come from that commission and uh, happy to see some um, connection here as well with Tammy and Nicole representing this both the city and the county. Thank you. Um, one other thing, other thing, I received information that my term is supposed to be up in July and they asked me if I'm interested in staying on and I said I, I would be so I don't know what will happen there. Um, I'm fully vaccinated. I hope everyone here is getting their vaccinations. <laughs> so uh, it's nice to be able to get out there a little bit more. Congratulations. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I didn't realize, so both uh, Commissioner Gillies and Maria Ramirez are both on the County Commission. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, moving along, Commissioner Gillies, any updates? Sure, and I would say that uh, Commissioner Murray Ramirez is, is the new co-vice chair of the county HRC, so very excited about that. Um, I would just put out there that uh, to Commissioner Higa's uh, comment that uh, if we are going to have a retreat once we get back into the real world, uh, we are happy to do as ADL some anti-bias training for all of us as we go forward facing into different communities that we have the language and just sort of do a little bit of training together. And um, so we're I'm putting that out there. If you wanna move forward with that, just let me know. Thank you. That would be fantastic. Sure. Can I add just one brief note on the retreat? Um, I know that the commission has had these in the past, but there are concerns about adherence to the Brown Act because it is a commission meeting. And so when we have the city attorney's office present at the next meeting, I think this is an important um, question to ask them because again, we wanna make sure that we're adhering to the Brown Act. So just wanna manage expectations a bit. Yeah, and I think we can notice it as a public meeting um, and hold the retreat as a public meeting. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Higa, do you have anything? Uh, to share. Well, I want to thank um, Olympia for giving us that information because I was checking into the, um, the identification and whatnot for vaccine. And one of the concerns that I found was um, there's some clinics that would ask, some won't. So there's no consistency statewide about identification and proof of identification and proof of uh, residency. So some clinics may ask for, um, they're not supposed to ask for ID, some, some clinics, and some are asking for proof of residency. So my question that was answered was the outreach for homeless people that don't have an address or resident. So I think it's still a, an issue where people are not getting the vaccine for many other reasons, but this concerns me when it, deals with identification. Thank you. Commissioner Moleg, anything to report? So I have a couple of things. One is just to, to piggyback off that community piece around vaccinations. Um, San Diego Pride had a partnership with the San Diego um, with UCSD and some other organizations and have already done 
uh, vaccinations for the transgender community. And this week they have another one that is for the BIPOC LGBTQ community, which I think is really important when they're um, set that way as Commissioner Beltrans talked about, people feel more comfortable being able to access that knowing that the people they're walking into are part of the community. So, um, so that was good. And um, we did a lunch and learn with city employees a few weeks back on um, the use of pronouns. So it was a small group of people, but it's a start of leading that, that piece around the educational uh, part that we talked about before. So small steps being taken. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Purcell, anything to report? Um, I don't have anything, but I do want to note that uh, Commissioner Beltran had something else to say. So if I could pass my time. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> just Thank you. I just wanted to clarify for Commissioner Higa that there are there's different protocols per county, not necessarily per by state. So um, our protocols down here in, in San Diego County are very specific to our community, especially being a border community. Um, it's going to vary from county to county. So our protocols when it comes to identification are going to be a little bit more sensitive and more broad because we deal with our homeless community, we deal with um, undocumented community. So we have a, a, a few different considerations mm -hmm. for different vulnerable community members that um, we've made protocols for within our county in order for us to distribute vaccine equitably right. and still have accurate documentation without um, causing any risk or damage to these vulnerable communities. And other counties may not have those same considerations in place. Um, could they benefit from them? Probably yes, but for here, for San Diego, um, it's of a higher concern for us. It's a higher priority for us, and we've implemented those protocols immediately, whereas in other counties, that discussion is still taking place. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Murray Ramirez. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you, Tammy. Yes, I was uh, elected a vice chair of the San Diego Human Relations Commission. And I hope and I know that we'll have good relationship between the city commission and the county since we have three uh, uh, county commissioners also here on this commission. Second of all, what I'm really excited about is that uh, Cindy Martin, our current superintendent of school and uh, President Biden's nominee to be under secretary of education uh, has formed a naming committee, a school naming committee. Um, we had our first meeting. I was very excited about it because uh, some, of, uh, some of the Native American members uh, spoke up and we actually kind of put a little halt uh, for more time on a name change in the school in Grossmont because of some of the concerns of, of the Native American <laughs> community. So that excited me because it's this school, this school a uh, naming committee is going to have some teeth in it, and it is definitely going to give recommendations uh, to the school board. That being said, if any of you, and I'm sure in the future we're going to be going over uh, this committee, uh, possible names and stuff, have um, names that you feel of San Diegans that should be honored with such a uh, school naming and stuff, please feel free to contact me and I'm because I'm already getting like a list of maybe possible nominees. Thank you. Thank you. That is great to hear. Uh, who else? Uh, Commissioner Razi Jafari. No, I don't have anything this week, so I'll yield my time since we're running low. Thank you. Commissioner Rizzo. Uh, I'll just say thank you to those who came and spoke to us today. I thought it was great. Um, and I know that we all feel it's very exciting to be thinking about how we can go out as a group to our community to um, really help since there's just continuing injustice, uh, hatred and conflict going on around there. And I would just say it's exciting too to really think about um, the partnerships that we can form with, with all of these various groups, including API, including Department of Justice. And anytime I think we can do that, we're all the better for it. And also when we can speak as a group 
Um, I know it's great we can speak as individuals, but if we can speak as a group, as HRC, um, I think that's also the most powerful that we can be. Thank you. And Commissioner Thomas. Um, I just wanted to go back to the SAMDAG thing real quick because it seems like I didn't, maybe I just didn't hear it. Were they going to stop using communities of concern? No. Is this something that we want to put on the next uh, agenda to figure out how we move it to the next level then? So we absolutely can. Um, their committee who is focused on equity reviewed it discussed it and decided that they did not want to stop using the term. Um, but we can certainly revisit it at our at our next uh, meeting. So we can put that on the agenda. My and we could invite is... them, um, if you'd like, we could invite the people uh, that Commissioner Conizales and I spoke to, um, to explain the rationale. My experience with Sandag is you have to constantly stay on them about these kinds of things. If you wanted to make any kind of change in policy, you have to remain vigilant about it. And we, we all here agree that words matter. So I think for our next meeting, this should be one of our topics of. Sounds, sounds good. We can certainly do that. And I think it was something, I mean, I was surprised, um, particularly when you look at the composition of the committee that reviewed it. Um, these are people, these are diverse members of our community, some people who are from, quote, communities of concern, um, who voiced that they um, were okay continuing to use the term, which was eye-opening to me. But I think we'll invite Sandag here and we can continue the conversation. And I appreciate your reminder that we must be vigilant. Thank and you. I am looking at time. Um, we have gotten through everybody's updates. Um, I think have had an educational evening, many robust conversations um, and action items moving forward. Again, I will ask everyone if there are issues that you want to share with us or invite community groups to share with us, just as we had the API Coalition um, with us tonight, please let me know. Um, I would love to get additional groups on future agendas. Um, and with that, I will adjourn our meeting. Thank you and have a good rest of your week, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.